right. <clears throat> Our Father, thank you for all the riches that you placed in Jesus, which are not for him alone, but for your body, the church, and through her, <clears throat> for all things, the whole world. We do pray that you would grant us humility to understand the greatness of your plan that you might be glorified even through our lives. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so we're working on uh, heaven in Ephesians. I have uh, lots of things I don't have clear memories of, but I have clear memory of sitting in the balcony of a Baptist church in Adelaide in 1975, listening to a series on the plan of God for unity. And central to that talk... Uh, was Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in heaven and things on earth. Well, this is a drama. God has a drama and, and the drama is the outworking of an eternal plan which encompasses the whole creation and this presentation about the plan um, really triggered off something in my imagination which has never left me. I went back and looked at the notes and I listened to the tape and years later I listened to the tape again. Um, it's this wonderful plan. Um, and the thing about Ephesians has a very high, very exalted Christology and it makes Jesus the centre, which he is, of a cosmic restoration. You know, we get sometimes stuck in our own restoration, but everything's being restored, and it will be restored. Now, from ancient times, basically as far back as you want to go, if you want to study religion or philosophy, people have thought about, you know, there has to be some sort of perfect world somehow, but how does this broken world of ours enter into some sort of unity? with a perfect heavenly sphere. And there's only one answer. That's the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the one, uh, a bit later in Ephesians, who fills everything in every way. Now, Ephesians is not a set of propositions, though it can be treated like that. It's not a set of uh, propositions setting out God's purposes, but it's a drama. It's a drama about how the... God's plan comes into being through the victory of Jesus over all the powers which resist the fulfilment of this plan. Now, is that clear? There's a plan which includes everything. It's centred upon Jesus and this plan is resisted by powers but over them Jesus is already victorious. Oh, Remember that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this actually opens on, Ephesians opens on a note, note of triumph. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual gift, where? In the heavenly places. Uh, so from the very beginning of, of the letter, the, the location of Jesus is important. God has raised him up from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He is the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus can enact the plan from heaven, God's plan, because heaven represents the site of a triumph. Humanity has returned to God into the fullness of the Godhead for us. And heaven and earth are being reconnected under the headship of Jesus. The goal of the heavenly Jesus is to rule over everything and fill all things for the glory of the Father. This is the God who, according to Ephesians 3.9, has created all things. So it is, it is the Son of this God, the Father, who can restore harmony to everything <coughs> in heaven and earth. Now, you know, we know not everything is harmonious <laughs> today. <laughs> Now think about your own inner life, think about family life, think about, well, the things Dale was quoting from the newspaper this morning, if you were here. 
in Jesus, right? Now I must emphasize that. Every Je in Jesus, every element of division, contradiction and alienation has been taken away. He has nullified all opposition to the purposes of God. Nothing can properly or legally or truly oppose the purposes of God. Well, well most of this complete unity which is in Christ is invisible. But there is a visible sign of it which is the inclusion of the Gentiles in the household of God because for a century after century it was only the only covenant people were the Jews. Once alienated from God's people, most of this is in Ephesians 2, we, that is the Gentiles, the Gentiles have now been brought near by the blood of Christ in whom the dividing wall of hostility has been removed. There's peace. In Christ we're all members of the same family of God and a temple in which God himself lives by the Spirit. Now at one level this is straightforward but Ephesians has this unique emphasis that the blessings we enjoy in Christ are in the heavenly places. Now this requires some explanation. So Christ is triumphant, everything is unified in him but these blessings which belong to the church, Jew and Gentile together, are accessible only in the heavenly places. What, what does it mean to be raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places? Now this is what we call regal language. It's the language of kingship. And Paul draws on Psalm 8 uh, in the first chapter of Ephesians when he says, God raised him, Jesus from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age but in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over everything to or for the church. So in Jesus we have a share in his dominion over everything from his heavenly position because the throne's in heaven. Not on earth, but one day it will be. <coughs> so Jesus has been raised up and us with him above all these powers and dominions and names which resist the plan of God. We're with him. Well, what are these powers? Who are these powers? And why do they resist the unity of God? You know, would it be sensible to resist the oneness, the harmony, the peace and the unity that God has achieve for us in Christ. Well, it's not sensible. So what's going on? And now we're talking about spiritual conflict. So if the one God created all things, there's an essential nature uh, of unity in everything. Everything is essentially one. And in the end, we will see everything in heaven and earth united in Christ. And Paul labours this when in the fourth chapter of, of Ephesians he talks about one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father. Then he goes and talks about one, one faith, one baptism and so on. But he's emphasising this oneness of God because this is saying that any division and disintegration can't be traced back to anything that God has ever been or, or has ever done. So where does the disunity that's always around us, where does it come from? It comes from hostile supernatural powers operating in the heavenly places. Now, they do operate on the earth, but from, the, from these heavenly places. So Paul says, in a very well-known uh, scripture, Ephesians 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against human beings, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now these are, these are the powers that are presently being subdued under the authority of Jesus. And in him we're called to resist them. Now it's really hard to talk about spiritual conflict because people actually go to one side or the other and I've got a quote in the fine text of this um, this talk about C.S. Lewis says you can you know, get fixated on the devil or you can ignore him. But I think there are some clues in Ephesians itself about the nature of this 
uh, spiritual warfare. Having expounded the purposes of God in raising believers into the heavenly places and God's uniting Jew and Gentile as one temple in the spirit, Paul goes on to introduce a prayer which begins with this. For this reason, I bow my knee before the Father from whom every family, where? In heaven and on earth receives its name. Now, Andrew has a song for us which picks up this um, scripture. If you all have a sheet, there's some spare sheets here. There's one a spare sheet here. Paul's Prayer in Ephesians. families on earth, this is the language of the Abrahamic blessing. <coughs> These are the, the peoples of the world who are called to receive the blessing of the covenant God had with Abraham. But presently in Ephesians, these are peoples, the Gentiles, who are following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. While the families in heaven... <coughs> are most likely the angelic families in the invisible realm, for in the Old Testament, angels are regularly called sons of God, and Satan himself, in Job at least, can appear amongst these sons of God. In the thought world of the Old Testament, which is the background, of course, to the New Testament, it seems that the government of God was to be manifested through angelic powers which were placed over the distinct people groups of the world. So it says in Deuteronomy 32, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, 
when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the people according to the number of the sons of God. Now I've got a little footnote about something to do with that text, but you don't have to worry about it now. So they've got the nations, and there's a correspondence between each people group, which is really an ethnic group, and these heavenly powers which are called the sons of God, angelic. However, by the time we get to Daniel, in the 10th chapter of Daniel, we find the nations seem to be ruled by evil powers, evil princes they're called, engaged in conflict with the holy angels of God. I don't want to dwell on that, but if the devil could be called by Jesus a father, in John 8, 44, who has sons or children amongst human beings, and I've got several references, the evil powers in the heavenly realms are sons who have rebelled against their true father. Which is, you know, God. The separation of these rebellious sons from their father creator has spilled down from the heavenly places to corrupt the relationship with God between God and his human children on earth. So the rebellion began in the heavenly places. If the conflict between the supernatural forces of evil in the heavenly places, which is, you know, Ephesians got a lot on this, and the realisation of the plan of God is a struggle over the nature and authenticity of fatherhood. Is there a real father? And who is the real father? Because there are contentions over fatherhood. There are always contentions over fatherhood. And a lot of my time is talking to people about such things. And there's only one person, only the true, true son, because if there's been a rebellion in heaven, a rebellion on earth, only the true son can reveal the father in fullness. And that's what Jesus said. If you see me, you've seen the father. Well, well what is the ministry of Jesus? The whole of Ephesians is written from a position of triumph. Christ has triumphed. And in chapter 4 in particular, you have this post-ascension perspective. Jesus has ascended back to heaven. Now here, quite importantly, Paul applies Psalm 68 verse 18. And he says, to quote, Therefore it says, quoting Psalm 68, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. It's really important to understand this, this background in, in Psalm 68, which is, it's a kingship psalm, and there's a victorious Israelite king, who's won a battle, and he, he goes up to the temple on Mount Sinai with his enemies trailing behind him. They've been taken captive. Now, this is a scene of you know, wild exultation because it's the triumph of God's king on earth. So the people are really excited. They're in celebration mode because of the victory of God through the earthly king. And they go up to the abiding presence of God in his sanctuary, which is to the physical temple. It's now us. Ephesians prophetically interprets the psalm as the triumphant procession of the exalted Christ through all the zones of heaven, whose powers, the demonic powers, he has subjugated, and he sits with his Father in heaven on his glorious throne. This is quite important. Where the earthly king took a host of human captives, the captives of Jesus are the demonic powers. They've lost all their authority. The cross and resurrection have stripped them of all authority and they're being led, led by the triumphal procession of the heavenly Christ. Now you need to get some sense of this because it's really quite critical to the whole structure of the Bible. With their power shattered, they can no longer separate the holy God in heaven from sinners on earth. In the psalm, the victory of the king, to quote, brings a revelation that God is fatherless of 
father of the fatherless. In Ephesians, it brings the revelation he is the father of Jew and Gentile alike. Remember, Paul says in Ephesians 2.12, we were without God and without hope in this world. That is, all the Gentiles were living in a fatherless, orphan condition. But now, in Christ, there's a revelation that God is the father of all. And that's really the gospel. And Paul saw the impact the gospel could bring by breaking into the history of all nations. Now, that has happened, and it's still happening. The history of nations, people groups, families on earth, in the ethnic sense, you know, are being drawn into the kingdom of God. Amazingly, Jesus is presently working to fill the universe with the fullness of God, completed in, in himself through the church. So I've just tried to explain in this drama of this procession of the triumphant king to the sanctuary of God. Jesus is that and he's subduing and has subdued in himself all these evil powers that have been taken captive. And he wants to express that victory through his people. Right? So, now I want to talk a little bit about the glory of the Father and how it's contested. God's plan revealed in Christ has created how many communities? One community. How many bodies? One body. In one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one mm. baptism, all under the Father. There's always oneness, oneness, oneness. All right? Um, you know, there's only one bride. Jesus doesn't have a harem, as they say. There's only, only one bride. There's only one temple. There's only one household. And it's, uh, it's, it's a shocking thing when it looks like something other than that, you know, multiple denominations and all this sort of stuff. Um, under the Father of glor the glory, who Paul says is over all and through all and in all, the church it lives as a community, at least called to live as a community, drawn from all nations, making God's plan in Christ, making God's plan in Christ, making God's plan in Christ known to rebellious heavenly powers. Now they don't want to know about this, but we're called to enforce the victory. Ministry, as Paul would say, in the unsearchable riches of Christ. Right? The unsearchable, or unfathomable riches of Christ. Things into which angels long to look. The depths of, the, of God's wisdom. We're called, and I'm quoting from Ephesians 3, verses 8 to 10, to bring to light for everyone, bring to light for everyone what is the plan, we started off by talking about the plan, to unite everything in Christ, what is the plan of the mystery, hidden for ages in God, because it's all about the very being and unity of God, hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, believe it, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known now to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now these rulers and authorities are the bad guys. We are to make known to them, whether they like it or not, and they don't like it, of the amazing wisdom of God in Christ. Now the very existence of the church, we're not told to preach to these powers, or to <coughs> shout to them or something, the very existence of the church is a testimony that the great fatherly plan for the unity of all things in Christ has been secured. So it's been secured by the blood of the cross, you see. God's previously hidden wisdom that he would triumph through the weakness of the cross has now been publicly made known through the preaching of the gospel and the creation of a new and all-inclusive people. That's us. So everybody's welcome. You go to church, everybody's welcome, isn't that right? It doesn't matter what you look like, where you come from. Yeah, you're all welcome. Because there's one God and Father of all. Well, that's what it says. Um, the living, loving unity of the church displays the victory of God and exposes the evil rulers in the heavenlies as fatherless and familyless. 
Right? That's what I believe. They don't have a real father. Because Satan's not a real father. He's, he's a counterfeit father. He's a fake father. He's a lying father. He's a deceiving father. But the love and the unity and the oneness of the people of God shows to these powers they are lost because they have lo left their father and they have adopted to themselves another father whose condemnation is assured. So the cosmic deceptions of the powers have been exposed and their future condemnation is revealed by the existence of the church. How amazing. As the church lives under the harmonious loving rule of God, it images to all creation the order which is coming. The church is called to be a sign of the restoration and transformation of all the structures of culture and life. Then you find that when you get to the end of the book of Revelation. Because the kings of the earth bring in the, the riches and treasures and I think that's everything about life and culture. The church is God's public exponent of love, unity and justice to all political and social spheres. So as the church is salt and light and lives the grace of God and the glory of God into all the spheres of existence, you know, we pray for the for the politicians, we pray for the artists, we pray for the academics, we pray for the engineers, whatever, that into those spheres of life where the demonic powers seek, seek to bring division and destruction, the life and light of Christ might come. Because it's through the church that this wisdom of God in reconciling all things in Christ through his blood is made known to these powers. That's our vocation. And it's to happen now. Well, what does this mean for church and ministry? This task of revealing the wisdom of God to the powers and bringing people to salvation is particularly dependent on the gifts that, that Christ gives to his body. So in Ephesians 4, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. The gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints, which is everybody, for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to, the, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the church is meant to be moving towards the maturity of Jesus. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, can you measure the stature of the fullness of Christ? No, you can't. Because the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ is the unfathomable, immeasurable wisdom of God. Mm. By sharing in the unity 